Moga Kibati is the Director General of the Vision 2030 Secretariat Board. And today we're speaking with him about where we are on the Vision 2030 and also about some of the challenges with implementing the vision. Hey, Moga. Hi, how are you? Really? Now, where are we at exactly with Vision 2030? Well, um, I can't really talk about where we are at without talking a little bit about what this whole journey is about. And Vision 2030 is what must be seen as a marathon, not a sprint. And all the questions we ask about Vision 2030 must be the kind of questions you'd ask a marathon as opposed to a, sp a sprinter. People ask me, are we on track? And I tell them, look, we're just five years into Vision 2030, into a 22-year program. And you've got to look at it like a journey. Um, and the analogy I gave, two analogies. One is a flight. You know, so you're flying from Nairobi to London, and you have a plane in a hangar. You've got to check that the plane is ready, mechanically ready to take off. Once you've done that, you've got to start the engines. That takes a while. Then you've got to reverse from the hangar, turn the plane, taxi onto the runway, and then begin to take off. And I would say that we spent the last five years doing the engine check, oiling, reversing out of the hangar, turning direction, and beginning to get to the runway. Now we're on takeoff. We're on real takeoff mode. Um, or if you're taking a journey from South Africa, you know, Cape to Cairo, you've got to make sure that you're prepared, everything is ready. So we're at the position where we're now ready to take off. Because in the first five years, we focused on very many basic fundamentals. Um, the economic pillar cannot work unless you have the social and political pillars working without the judicial reforms we've had in the first five years, without some of the infrastructural uh, adjustments, the roads that need to be built, energy, um, uh, ports and airports. You can't have industries investing here. Now we are beginning to see a lot of investors convinced that they can afford to come to Kenya and put up an industry or a, or a factory that takes up 200 megawatts of power because they know, they can see in our plans, we have the 200 megawatts of power available. Five years ago we didn't have any of that. Um, now we're beginning to see investors who see that the integration with the South African community is real and therefore they're not, they're not just looking at 40 million people, they look at 130 million people. And for many of these big companies, numbers matter, you know, economies of scale matter. So I would say that where we are at, takeoff mode, we didn't achieve the 10% um, uh, growth, uh, GDP growth rate that we were targeted to achieve by 2012 because of what happened in 2008. Um, in 2007, you may recall, we were at 7% growth rate, but that shot down to 1.6%. It was clear we were, never, we were not going to do 1.6 to 10 in three years. Mm -hmm. But I'm pretty confident that now, this upcoming financial year, we're going to do 6%. And by 2017, we'll be hitting the 10%. And the, the goal will be to sustain the 10%. And once we hit 7 8%, the job creation, the opportunities for business will be such that they begin to now um, uh, uh, take up the whole unemployment uh, crisis that we have right now. They will begin to provide opportunities for people to move from the informal sector to the formal sector. We'll begin to formalize the economy. When we, as we formalize the economy, it means we have more revenues as a country for social programs in education, in health, even for infrastructure. Because today what we have with 80% of the economy being informal, they don't pay taxes, but they use your roads, they use your power, they use, you know, they go to your schools, the kids go to your schools, public schools, but they don't contribute to the kitty. And part of the goal of transforming from an underdeveloped country to a more developed country is to have that envelope of formal sector growing so that we are all contributing to the social amenities. Moga, well, let's just take a step back because you've said something which is um, quite sort of poignant right now about what happened in 2007 and 2008. And of course, if you've seen recent press reports, um, Kenya now has the dubious um, ranking of, I believe, 14th or 17th uh, fa most failed state in the world as a result of those de uh, events. And despite what we have just gone through, which is a very peaceful election and a scramble back to you know rebuild the economy. Is it 
at all practical to say at this point that investors feel confident in the 14th most failed state in the world, where one of the reasons cited for that particular ranking is impunity, and another one is poor governance, the third being insecurity, which touch on all of the main pillars of Vision 2030. Well, I think you, 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 you've correctly ascribed this rating to 2008. And frankly speaking, it's an aberration. And it's an aberration that we may have to live with maybe for another couple of election cycles, because obviously the events were traumatic. And they shattered, um, they shattered the reputation that Kenya had of many years of peace. But they had a silver lining because out of those events, those events woke us up as a country. We have a new constitution partly because of those events. And when I talk about investors, there are two classes of investors into Kenya and into Africa. Savvy investors understand and realize that what happened in 2008 was an aberration. They realize and they've seen that Kenyans were so shocked by those events that they took the drastic, uh, the drastic step of enacting very quickly a radical, a ra radically different constitution. I mean, if you look at where we were on the 3rd of March 2013 and where we were on the 5th of March, the systems of government were so radically different. Few countries, few nations in this world have ever done what we've done. And that was a testament to the, how seriously Kenyans took 2008. Mm -hmm. And survey investors understand this. You know, I talk to, when I talk to investors, and I'll say this, you know, uh, our European investors and Eastern investors are very savvy because the European investors have been in Africa for ages. That's colonial masters. So they understand Africa more. So you find a lot of international or multinational companies from Europe, you know, they don't. They, they don't get bothered. You know, if you look at all the banks, look at the top five institutions in the stock exchange, you know, the, the biggest uh, capped, market capped companies, British companies, which have been here for ages, they understand the business have grown in lips and bounds through 2008. And we're talking to newer investors, especially American investors, and telling them, look, you know, you invest in Kenya for the long haul, and you'll get dividends. Google, Google made the decision to set up their Sub-Saharan African office in Nairobi at the height, at the height of the 2008 post-election violence, because they take a long-term view. We've seen GE. GE set up the Africa, the Africa headquarters in Nairobi just last year. Increasingly, we are seeing not just new uh, multinationals from non-traditional investors into Africa, the US market, um, setting up in Nairobi as the African capital. In spite of all these ratings, in spite of 2008, we are also seeing older companies, such as Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola has been in Africa and in Kenya for a long time, but just last year they made the decision to move their headquarters for their 39 East and Western African countries to Nairobi. So survey investors, people who understand the depth, people who see beyond the surface, actually are making the decisions to invest in this country. And those are the people we are targeting. Because those are the people who look at the long term. They're the biggest, the GEs, the Coca-Colas, Google, those are the biggest uh, companies uh, globally. And the rest who get excited or frightened by the reports they're talking about will eventually follow the big boys. So, We've got to be systematic and, understand, and, and patient and understand that we made a mistake as a nation in 2008. And to some extent, we have a price to pay. But the story doesn't end there. We've got to realize we, you know, we made a mistake. We're now picking up. And we've been picking up systematically. And we should congratulate ourselves. The elections this year were a testament to that. The fact that we had two institutions of the new constitution, the election and the judiciary, tested. Yes, the elections body was found wanting, but you've got to cut them some slack in terms of they, we have a significant improvement from the ECK of 2007 and 2002. What people don't realize is that I want that standards as Kenyans have gone up very, very high. You know, what, what they refer to as the shambolic nominations that were held um, earlier this year before the general election. We've, we've analyzed them. And you can ask anybody, ask, ask the most uh, ask the most uh, uh, critical civil society members, and they'll tell you that these nominations were the best Kenya has ever had. Why they were so prominently bad is because the issue transparency, 
accountability is so much higher. Kenyans demand so much. Well, that is good. But in 2002, 2007, party bosses were selling nominations, just uh, announcing, you know, uh, one morning getting up and saying, in these constituencies, so-and-so is running for member of parliament, and that was it. We forget that. But this time around, people wanted their choice respected, and they made noise about it. And uh, in the general election, uh, we had uh, electronic uh, you know, problems. But in terms of the arrangement, in terms of the fact that this was six elections in one day, it was a tremendous exercise. We have a lot of work to do, of course, with IABC. The judiciary came out, I think, in flying colors. Um, we had the same kind of a dispute as we had in 2008. But this time, it was adjudicated very differently. And you know, we had, within a couple of weeks, a newly inaugurated president. Well, let's test that a little bit, uh, Mugo, if we may. Two things. One is that there are some th there are different views on how the judiciary came out, especially in relation to that ruling. But we don't go, want to go specifically in relation to that ruling. But the reforms that are going on in the judiciary. One of the traditional complaints about our judiciary is how slow it is, how inefficient it is, and how it does not cater for time passing, especially where there have been breaches of contract. On the other hand, in relation to the judiciary's all of the law reforms that I'd love for us to talk about um, in a while, but a lot of what your vision hinges on is on having a very solid bedrock insofar as the judiciary is concerned, insofar as turnaround is concerned. And we're still in a state of backlog. We're still in a state where we have fewer judges than what is required, where we have cases that are five, six, sometimes seven years old that have not been adjudicated and where, quote unquote, files have been lost. And it's against this background that investors must come in and test their luck in what are very long-term projects if the Vision 2030 is to, in fact, be realized. No, I think you make a, uh, you're absolutely right. And uh, actually, I, I will actually even address the, the whole thing about the Supreme Court decision. Look, no one expects that you have a credible judicial system when nobody has any complaints. That's what we're looking for. What, what we're looking for is judgments that hold. In 2000, Bush versus Go in the United States of America, the US Supreme Court had a 5-4 decision for George Bush. All the five Republican appointees in the judiciary voted for George Bush. The four Democratic appointees voted for Al Gore. Democrats were apoplectic about the decision. They were furious about it. They complained. They said this court was biased, but they respected the decision. It stood. Let us not you know, uh, set for a, a standard that is unrealistic. Nobody is suggesting, no way in the world does that happen, that we want a judge, a judiciary where Every pronouncement they make, every decision they make, we are all kumbaya and happy about it. It's never going to happen. It's an unrealistic and ridiculous standard to set for ourselves. All we're saying is, a judgment was made. Many, many, many Kenyans were unhappy with that decision, and I understand. It will always happen, but it stood. We all said, fine, we disagree with it, or we agree with it, but it stands. That's the standard we're looking for. Now, in terms of the backlog of the cases, you're absolutely right. The work that has to be done is its massive. The Chief Justice actually has a special project, a special initiative addressing the backlog cases because he finds himself trying to reform a judicial system, which in and of itself is a tremendous task, while at the same time trying to clear a 20-year backlog of cases, business cases, personal cases, criminal, you know, all sorts of cases. And that's a separate, he, he has a special initiative for that. It will take, frankly speaking, a couple of years. Can business afford a couple of years? This is the I, point. Businesses will take the two years as opposed to the 20 years they had before. They will. If you talk to the private, talk to Kepsa. They are very, very satisfied with the steps the Chief Justice is taking. They realize that, unfortunately, they do have some waiting to do because you can't just take, you know, 2,000 cases and say, in one month, clear this backlog. It does take some time. But the fact is, these were cases that typically would take 15 to 20 years. They now have reasonable confidence in the judiciary that over the next two to three years, they'll all be cleared. And after that, we'll have a clean slate where we now have you know, cases coming in, fast in, fast out, FIFO system. We can't get in the FIFO system until we do clear the backlog. The backlog requires a special project because it's such a many, so many years of 
you know, the wrong thing having been done. The business uh, community actually, all they were asking for is a plan, just to see a plan that is reasonable, that is credible to deal with that process. They aren't asking for anyone to wave a magic wand and tomorrow these cases are cleared. That in itself would not be justice. I mean, because they do have to actually, they've got to be adjudicated properly. You know, they have to be had. Uh, and I think so far the Chief Justice has been able to convince uh, the business sector, especially if you talk to Kepsa, uh, that there is a plan. It is not what, you know, it isn't perfect. They wish to, you know, but there, there is a plan which is credible uh, to deal with those cases. And, and you're correct that that is fundamental to Vision 2030. The ability of you as a businessman or woman to set up in Nairobi, to set up in Kilifi, to set up in Mandara, be able to transact business, get into contracts that you know will be honored, and if they are not honored, you know there's a judicial system that will enforce them. It's critical to Vision 2030, and that's what uh, the judiciary is working on. Very, um, when you see just a couple of days ago, um, the, the, the Chief Justice opening the first ever, the first ever Court of Appeal outside Nairobi in Yeri, very soon Kisumu, very soon Mombasa. Why? Because previously you had three, you know, uh, bunches of three Court of Appeal, there were three sets, because there were only nine judges in the Court of Appeal. They would, they would be divided into three, and they'd go around the whole country, you know, trying to adjudicate cases. Now we have over 20 um, Supreme, I mean, uh, Court of Appeal judges. They're in five stations, not just in Nairobi, across the country. We have the same thing being cascaded downwards in terms of the high courts, high courts all over the country. And, and this is going to be a process. You know, you don't want to fracture a judge overnight. You know, a judge is still somebody who goes to school, goes to, gets a law degree, has experience. So it isn't a magic wand, but there's a process. And all I can say is the process that has begun is actually so credible that the biggest critics do acknowledge something has been done. But again, and I think at, the, at your show recently I kept saying this, and people get, keep, you know, they sort of get tired of me saying it, but I have to say it. The reason we have a program, Vision 2030, which is a 22-year program, is precisely because many of the mistakes we made over 50 years will not take two, three years to rectify. They will take the 20 years of Vision 2030 to rectify. What I think we should keep measuring what people have to keep hammering us is to say, are we on the program? Are we, you know, just as you asked me on the judiciary, and the answer is yes, we are. Uh, we are definitely on the program in many, many areas. There are some areas such as security, I think we have to do a bit better. But you've seen that the president has taken personal, uh, has, has taken very, 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 very personal, paid personal attention to the issue of security. One of the, you know, beyond his campaign, um, uh, his campaign pledges, one of the things he's focused so much on is the police, making sure that the police are properly funded, making sure that the police have got adequate amounts of vehicles. The 1,200 vehicles the police are getting this year, we've been asking for this for years, and we thought it would never happen. Now it is beginning to happen. Uh, and so I think that we're beginning, uh, after, after, after five years and doing an audit of Vision 2030, we do think that we have to do a lot more in security, but I'm glad the new government is doing that. Well, speaking of things that people have been asking for a very long time, we're now seeing the um, rise of teachers who have, well, not the rise, more the downing of tools by teachers who have decided not to go back to work until they actually get the pay due to them for years. And the worrying statement by the cabinet, the cabinet secretary for labor saying that uh, the government is under no obligation to in fact honor a legal notice that was passed in 1997 and his intention to revoke it in favor of something that he has not made quite clear. And this again sends the wrong signals, does it not? Because if government can one morning wake up and say, well, actually we are not under any obligation to honor our word, then this portends very, very poorly for, number one, for business, two, for any kind of long-term investment in the country. Look, Rene, um, I agree with you that uh, governments must, governments have to be uh, of such a high standard of probity that they cannot just renege on uh, previous governments commitments. I think Kenyans, citizens anywhere across the world must be able to rely on the fact that if you have a government that makes certain commitments, the government will meet those commitments. If you've got a title deed, it's respected. But having said that, I think you're oversimplifying a very complex 
uh, process that Kenyans are going through. It isn't just in education. The transformation we are talking about is also one from, you know, coming from an era in which, frankly speaking, uh, people in high positions of public, you know, in public office use their discretion to make arbitrary decisions that were completely, completely against, um, you know, ag against Kenya's uh, best interests for personal gain. We know that across the board. So putting education aside, look at the issue of title deeds. The same debate comes up. You know, we, have, we have had a big debate about where land was grabbed and acquired you know, in, in, in dubious ways and dubious means, but eventually, because people were in power, title deeds emerged and materialized on those pieces of land. How do you handle that? It's, it's, not, a, it's not a very simple thing to address, because if you had public land that had been designated for public facilities, you know, well is for highways and, and, and railway systems, or public parks, but was grabbed and converted into personal property using title deeds. 20, 30 years down the road, how do you handle that? You must respect the instrument we call a title deed issued by a government. On the other hand, you must also address the injustices of the past. If you look at the TJRC report, that was, it's, it's, it's replete with those kind of conundrum that how do we deal with it? So the case of the uh, uh, teacher strike and the commitments made in the past, and I don't know to wade into a debate that is ongoing and alive, and I don't want to get you know, to step into uh, an ongoing discussion. But I think we have to appreciate the complexity that the cabinet secretary is having to deal with, because it isn't merely saying that there was a previous government that made certain commitments. That is true. But as in many other cases, I'll give you the example of land in this country, we have commitments made, but we just have to say, wait a minute, how do we handle or redress without um, abusing the sanctity? of government commitments, but how do you redress past injustices or past arbitrary decisions made for political reasons? So it's a, it's a complex situation. Um, I think we have to go through it. We are going to go through it. Um, for me, I think that on the other end of it, by the end, you know, in, in a few weeks' time, I think we shall be past this. We may have a price to pay, one or the other. Either we have, you know, either, either, either the wage bill has to go up and we have to find other ways of dealing with that in terms of growing the economy much faster than the rise in the wage bill, or um, those people who were asking for higher wages may have to say, wait a minute, um, yes, certain commitments, yes, we have these legal documents or these commitments in the past, but let's be realistic. This is where Kenya is today. Can Kenya really afford, as a country, the kind of wage bill uh, that is portended if all the demands that are in the public arena today are met? So I think it's going to be a complex, um, a complex journey. My concern with that statement is sitting on the other end of the table as a taxpayer, it sounds to me like doublespeak because my very leader, along with others, has just been in parliament and their first order of business was to award themselves an exorbitant amount of money for reasons best known to themselves, all of the reasons of which were pretty much that they need to give handouts. That's pretty much what it boiled down to from where I was sitting as a taxpayer. And then by the same token, someone who is actually delivering a service that is vital for the economy, that is vital for the growth of this country, education, um, medical services, is being asked to be realistic with a pay that quite frankly does not reflect the cost of living in Kenya. And that right there captures the essence of the, the, the question that is the delivery of the 20. 30 vision. Can we actually have one group or one tier of people who are able to say, well, we need to award ourselves better and we should be allowed to operate within a certain level of discretion that is frankly only available to them by virtue of power, while the rest of the country waits and hopes that the delivery of what is a fantastic vision takes place within this hot mess that is the politics of Kenya and the economy of Kenya today? Look, I concede that um, uh, what transpired with the debate between this, uh, the SRC and Parliament was unfortunate. And two, rights don't make, two, two wrongs don't make a right. You know, uh, The fact that one wrong has happened in one case doesn't make the other wrong right. So I'm going to argue that the complexity that the Cabinet Secretary for Labor is dealing with is still true, regardless of the truth in the statement you're making about the fact that 
um, the issue with parliamentary salaries could have been handled much, much better. I agree with that, totally. And I, ho I wish that could have been a different way. But that that went the way it went doesn't negate the fact that across the board, because it's not just going to be teachers, it's going to be everybody very soon. And the fact is, it doesn't change the fact that we can't afford it. So maybe the public needs to say, don't say that two, three, four, five wrongs make a right. Say, wait a minute. One wrong thing happened. We're not going to get a second, let a second, third one happen. And we'll still go back. We shall still go back and address this first wrong. Because ultimately, and I've said this very many times, um, we must look at ourselves as citizens of this country and ask ourselves, why do we have the kind of behavior we have in parliament? We have the kind of behavior we have in parliament partly because we have a warped value system in this country. The entire citizenry, not just our leadership. Um, and I'll tell you, I, I made so many presentations last year, Vision 2030 presentations, and I spoke about values. And I spoke about the 10th parliament. And I made this prediction to every, to my view, and I'm on tape. And I said, you know what, we're now in the 10th parliament. You all think this 10th parliament is the worst parliament ever. It's worse than the 9th. Well, I promise you the 11th parliament will be worse than the 10th. And guess what? If you ask anybody today, this 11th parliament is worse, worse than the, 9th, uh, the 10th parliament. Guess what? The 12th will be even worse. Until we realize the problem isn't parliamentarians. The problem isn't teachers. The problem isn't the president. The problem isn't permanent secretaries. The problem is us. We have to say, what is our value system? When you find MPs openly talking about having to give out handouts, and we, you know, without butting an eyelid, and we don't, we don't do nothing about it. You know, we don't protest ab about the fact that it is true. It is true that they have to give out handouts. And by the way, our religious organizations are terrible culprits. You know, when you, you know, if you want to see how bad a society has been, go to church and see how they treat these politicians. You know, an MP walks into a church event and he won't walk out without having given 100,000 shillings for some funny project that is concocted by the pastor in that church. Do they know where he's getting 100,000 shillings from? Do they care if it's corrupt money or not? Do they care if the domino effect is that that same member of parliament will next year be in parliament saying, I need another 100,000 shillings to give to my church? So we have to address our values. Do I have a silver bullet for that? I don't. Um, but I think we have to put that d uh, discussion on the table. I did challenge a few members of parliament uh, and told them, look, why don't you guys put the real issue on the table instead of arguing for higher salaries? Why don't you actually put the debate on the floor about the value system in this country? Why don't you pass campaign finance reform? We need a campaign finance reform bill in this country. Kenyans should be campaigning for that. Members of parliament should be forced to get a campaign finance reform bill that puts strict regulations on the kind of money habits we have in this country, you know, between elected leaders and their electorate. Um, and all these things, even if they were to be enacted today, doesn't mean that they you know, will change culture in one day. It's going to be a process. And uh, <laughs> I have come to the realization that the many things ailing our society require a process of transformation. And what is most important is that we don't just give up or throw our hands in the air or bury our head in the sand or get overwhelmed by the enormity of the problem, but just to start saying, let's start. Even if it takes 20 years to change culture, to build roads, to build ports and airports, to reform the education system and the healthcare system, let's get started and let's plod on, regardless of what uh, the problem is. So I would say in terms of the specific problem with the members of parliament, campaign finance reform is critical. It is part of the bills that are supposed to be passed. It hasn't. It ought to have been passed actually last year. The, the very bad 10th parliament delayed it. Now we have a very bad 11th parliament. We shall all keep having terrible parliaments until we address the real issue, uh, Rene. Um, now, I'm, I'm not justifying anything. I'm just saying we must begin to address the real issue. I want to appeal to the media to help us get this subject discussed. Let's get the discourse about the real issue. When the leader of the majority stood up in parliament and said Kenyans are thieves, remember how shocked everyone was. And I said, you know what? I think the only mistake he made was he did not expound on what he meant, right? But what he meant was, you make us what we are. Is it an excuse? It's not. As a leader, I believe that parliamentarians as leaders should help us change society. We should challenge them to do that.
I want to sort of move away a little bit and more into the nuts and bolts of the actual rollout of the Vision 2013. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> you are welcome very much. <laughs> now, um, we've seen it. We've seen the um, setup of the new cabinet secretaries and the appointments, etc., that has been ongoing. And we now have a secretary, of course, for planning. How does this all work out? How, what is the relationship between the Vision 2030 board, the um, planning secretariat, and the government at large to ensure that the Vision 2030 is not only rolling out according to plan, but that people and institutions are held accountable for the steps that they need to be taking to get the vision underway? Well, let me start first of all by saying that the president, the deputy president, and the Cabinet Secretary for Devolution and Planning have stated very clearly that uh, Vision 2030 is at the center of these government uh, programs. In fact, if you've listened to the President himself, or the Cabinet Secretary, or the Deputy President, they're always talking about Jubilee, Vision 2030, and the Constitution. In one sentence, in one breath, those are critically important. I mean, the, the, the next four years, the next five years are about key Jubilee uh, priorities Vision 2030 and implementing the Constitution, especially making the evolution work. And, and, and in fact, our, the Cabinet Secretary for Devolution Planning, that's really uh, her focus and her remit. Um, I should also say and remind Kenyans a couple of things. The manifestos of the three main contenders last year, or earlier this year rather, Jubilee, Cord, and Amani, were well, largely predicated on the Vision 2030. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Jubilee Manifesto, at the preamble of that manifesto, talks about the fact that Vision 2030 is at the center of their programs. Many of the Jubilee priorities, such as the Saturnus Gage Railway Line, is a Vision 2030 uh, project. Uh, Lapset, you know, the Lamu Corridor project, is a Vision 2030 uh, project, which is, a, which is a Jubilee priority. So I think it's important, first of all, to, 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 to let everyone rest, you know, put everyone to rest on the fact that Vision 2030 program goes on and in many cases is actually accelerated because uh, the Jubilee government is very clear in terms of wanting to fast track many I mean critical infrastructure projects critical ag agriculture and agribusiness projects education reforming the education system um, you, you will recall that um, over the last two years there was a there was a task force appointed by the previous uh, Minister for Education that looked at reforming the entire education system in order to align it to the Constitution and to Vision 2030. That task force report was released last year, and the result of that task force's report is eight new laws that were just signed into law by the uh, former president in January. We are now about to start implementing those eight laws. Those eight laws are about squarely putting the education system into the Vision 2030 program, you know, new curriculum, skills, critical skills thinking. Now, if you look at the Jubilee project, uh, the laptop project, and, and, and I've always said, for me personally, beyond the issue of a different, more efficient way of disseminating the curriculum or equitable way of disseminating the curriculum, for me, it's most important as a paradigm shifting initiative, you know, just having the debate we're having about laptops in this country, pro call uh, for and against the fact that parents are discussing it the fact that MPs are discussing it you and I all, all are discussing should we spend this kind of money on the laptop just that debate I mean parents in Turkana are discussing it can you imagine a paradigm shift in that that a parent in Turkana in Gansi in Mandara is talking about a laptop for her kid whether she is for or against it what is it what does it mean you can imagine when the kids finally have the laptops whatever they are whether they're in a you know beautiful classroom that looks like this office or they are under a tree. Regardless, of course we'd have, we'd hope that as many if not all children are in a proper classroom, there's electricity in that school, but even in the case where they have a laptop under a tree, that in itself is a paradigm shifting thing. And so, and I believe that Vision 2030 requires a paradigm shift. Who has the whip in the event that the cabinet secretaries or the various organizations and institutions are not actually undertaking their role or are not meeting their targets within this Vision 2030 devolution. Who has the whip? Um, uh, the President is, is, a, is the appointing authority of the Cabinet Secretaries. He chairs the Cabinet. He's given them his marching orders. Um, if you recall at um, uh, the swearing-in ceremony of the Cabinet Secretaries, he gave them marching orders. 
and one of those critical marching orders was to go out and implement Vision 2030. Um, we are under the Ministry of uh, Devolution and Planning, as a, the, and the Vision Delivery Board um, uh, has the mandate from the, from the Cabinet Secretary for Planning to undertake Vision 2030, to provide strategic leadership and vision uh, for this. We already have mechanisms entrenched in our performance contracting system. If you, if, if you, you know, I should tell you this. Uh, the Vision Delivery Board has entrenched Vision 2030 into the performance contracting system of this country. So every ministry, every department and agency of government has clear Vision 2030 targets in their performance contract. They give quarterly reports. They get feedback from us on whether they're performing or not performing. They will be graded on how they perform on those projects. One of the most encouraging things I've had from the new government is that they intend to reform and improve the performance contracting system. That will only make it that much easier to ensure that the right projects under Vision 2030 are being implemented at the right pace and at the right budget. So I want to reassure you that in terms of monitoring, assessing the pace of progress on Vision 2030, I expect it to be enhanced under this new government. Who carries that whip? Obviously, ultimately, it's the president. And the president, as you've seen, is a very hands-on um, uh, manager and with very clear targets for each cabinet department. And therefore, and that cascades down to each of the various uh, agencies and, uh, of government. Each have, will have very clear targets, and they must meet them. Mogo Kibati, Director General of the Vision 2030 Board. Thank you so much for taking time to talk with us today. And uh, that's all for today. And when we come back, we'll be talking more about some of the challenges that we are facing in Kenya and also celebrating some of the milestones that we have come through. Uh, this is Renee Gamal for Capital TV. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.